Hi everyone, welcome back to Neurobiology at Providence College. I'm Joe DeGeorges. Today we're going to review one of my favorite papers by Linda Buck and Richard Axel titled, A Novel Multigene Family May Encode Odorant Receptors, A Molecular Basis for Odor Recognition. One of my favorite aspects of the paper is how wonderfully it's written. This paper contributed extensively to our understanding of how we detect odor, that is how we smell and Buck and Axel won the Nobel Prize for their work. First of all, all of our senses, sight, hearing, taste, touch, and smell, occur by specialized neurons that detect the outside world. Rods and cones, for instance, are specialized cells in our retina that detect quantity of light and color. In their paper, in figure one, Buck and Axel have a nice figure, a diagram, of the cells of the olfactory system. And we've already said that we detect the outside world through specialized neurons, whether it's vision or smell, taste, and so on. And in the olfactory system, there are olfactory sensory neurons that are believed to detect the outside world. They have, so these are neurons. called olfactory sensory neurons. Then they have supporting cells like this. And of course, both cell types have nuclei. And then there's a third cell type that are called basal cells at the base of the tissue, like this. And something like that. Okay, so basal cells, these support cells, and the specialized olfactory sensory neurons. I'll read a little bit from their publication. The primary events in odor detection occur in specialized olfactory neuroepithelium located in the posterior region of the nasal cavity. I mean, of course, we smell with our nose. Three cell types dominate this epithelium, the olfactory sensory cells, the supporting cells, and basal cells, which is a stem cell that generates olfactory neurons throughout life. So the basal cells continue to form new sensory cells, new olfactory sensory neurons. They say, the initial events in odor discrimination are thought to involve the association of odors with specific receptors on the cilia of olfactory neurons. So these here are the cilia, and they say that odor detection is thought to be through receptors in the membrane of the cilia. And they know this in part because if you remove these cilia, you cut them, surgically remove these cilia in a mouse, the mouse can no longer smell. They say the cilia are also the site of olfactory signal transduction. If you expose isolated cilia, that is you remove the cilia, in this case from rat, and they add the odor, then they stimulate adenylate cyclase activity and you have an increase in the production of cyclic AMP. So what they mean is if they remove these and put them in a dish or in a test tube, you have the cilia here and you add an odorant, then these release cyclic AMP. And cyclic AMP is produced by adenylate cyclase. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about figure one, part B. So, a general hypothesis of how we smell is outlined in figure 1b. And again, to go back to A for a second, 
they say that we smell, that we detect odor or detect smells by receptors that are in the membrane of specialized olfactory sensory neurons. So this has an axon ultimately that goes to the brain. And that there are likely to be receptors for odors in the membrane of the olfactory sensory neuron. So here in this part of the cell. And if we redraw this lipid bilayer, of course we have our heads and tails of the phospholipids, and I'll just draw it as two lines. And this is the outside of the cell here, where the arrow is pointing. And then, of course, this is the inside of the cell. So looking here. And what they say is that there's probably receptor molecules in the cell, in the membrane of the cell, it's with regions that span the lipid. And if an odor binds to a specific receptor that can detect that odorant, then there is a conformational change, that is a shape change, in this receptor molecule, which is bound to a GTP binding protein. So there are three subunits. There is an alpha subunit, a beta subunit, and a gamma subunit of the GTP binding protein. And in this configuration, this alpha subunit is bound to G DP. So these proteins are called GTP binding proteins, guanosine triphosphate binding proteins. But in this configuration, where the alpha subunit is associated with the beta and gamma subunit and also associated with the receptor molecule, the alpha subunit is associated with guanosine diphosphate at this point. When an odorant binds to a specific receptor that can detect and bind to the odorant, then there is a conformational change in the receptor mo molecule. That is, it changes its shape. And when it changes its shape, the change is detected inside the cell here where the alpha subunit is bound to the receptor. And that change in shape, the conformational change, causes the alpha subunit to release from the receptor molecule. And it also causes the GDP to be dropped from the alpha subunit and replaced by GTP, guanosine triphosphate, rather than guanosine diphosphate. So now we have an alpha subunit like this bound to GTP, guanosine triphosphate. That molecule then, that is the alpha subunit, can bind to a second protein called adenylate cyclase. So now we have the alpha subunit here. And when the alpha subunit binds to adenylate cyclase, the adenylate cyclase converts adenosine triphosphate, ATP, into cyclic AMP, that is monophosphate, cyclic adenosine monophosphate. And that molecule can then bind to a third transmembrane protein that's a cyclic AMP gated ion channel. So cyclic AMP binds to a channel and that allows ions, sodium, to flow from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell 
and cause an action potential in this specialized neuron. And that sends the action potential and the signal down the axon into the brain and somehow the brain interprets that as a specific odor. It turns out that after the cyclic AMP is generated, this alpha subunit hydrolyzes the ATP, I'm sorry, the GTP, it hydrolyzes the GTP to GDP, diphosphate, and now the alpha subunit bound to GDP can reassociate with the receptor and with the beta and gamma subunits and reset the system to detect another odor. So in this paper, Buck and Axel are trying to figure out what the receptor molecules are. What exactly are these receptors that detect the odorant? And they say that they make three assumptions. They mention their assumptions in their experimental strategy. And the first assumption is that the receptor molecules which are going to be some type of protein, a gene product, that they bind to GTP, whoops, GTP binding proteins and they say this because we mentioned earlier that if you dissect the cilia off of the olfactory neurons and put them in a dish and you add an odorant that that induces adenylate cyclase activity and the production of cyclic AMP. And it was known by that time that GTP binding proteins were the proteins that induced adenylate cyclase activity. The second assumption was that the receptors were part of a large multi-gene family Oops, a large multi gene family, meaning that the proteins are all closely, the receptor proteins are closely related to one another and, and came about through gene duplication events. And it's a large multi gene family because there are many odors that we can detect and you would need a different receptor for each type of odor. The third assumption is that the receptors are expressed and present in the nose. The organ that we use to detect odor or to smell. So they bind GTP binding proteins because GTP binding proteins induce adenylate cyclase activity and odors have been shown to increase adenylate cyclase activity in the production of cyclic AMP. They must be part of a large multi-gene family because we can detect a lot of odors and we need a different receptor for each odor and the receptors are likely to be expressed only in the nose, the organ that we use to detect smell. 